the cruelty on display in some games. They don't just brutalize you on the regular, they also love tricking you into thinking that a tough boss fight or sequence is over, and it's not. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 times games tricked you into thinking that you won. So, we put out a video a little while ago called 10 times a game tricked you into thinking it ended. We talked about some absolute classics. The first Donkey Kong Country, a lot of Final Fantasy games, Dark Souls 2, Okami, Metal Gear Solid 5, Near Automata. Wow, Near Automata. But that got us thinking this doesn't just happen at the end. There's a lot of points in games throughout that sort of trick you into thinking that you're the victor. Often when you just barely manage to pull victory from the jaws of defeat, that's when the boss gets up, dusts himself off, and smashes your face into concrete. It's demoralizing. Uh, before I get started, I'm gonna give you a sort of a blanket spoiler warning, cause obviously surprises get spoiled when you say what happens. So, without further ado, starting off with number 10, it's Finish Grundy from Batman Arkham City. Uh, the achievement slash trophy for beating Solomon Grundy pops up after the second phase of the fight. So, like, you really think you beat him, and then he gets back up. I mean, his first form's pretty straightforward stuff. He's the first major boss of Arkham City. He's kind of a weird Frankenstein-like character who, I don't know, pops up in a lot of DC stuff. But you damage him until his health bar is nearly gone. That causes the penguin to power him up. and in most games, that'd be the end of it. Two forms is usually more than enough for a game like this, but Rocksteady just wanted to go a little bit further than everybody else, so of course the fight does not end here. After you drain that health bar a second time, you get that achievement, which is really a big old fake out, and then the real last form of Solomon Grundy happens. It's not crazy hard or anything. He's the first real boss, so, uh, but that doesn't stop it from being an iconic Arkham game moment that absolutely warrants mention here. The trophy, it's just, it's a genius thing to do. They kind of tell you they're not messing around by doing that. And number nine, Dr. Ned is dead from Borderlands, the zombie island of Dr. Ned. In the whole Xbox 360 PS3 era, the zombie DLC was such a big thing. It was Red Dead Redemption Undead Nightmare, Call of Duty was inundated with it, and Borderlands had it as well. This was actually the first DLC for the game, and for me, the expectations were rock bottom. The whole thing feels like a small throwaway adventure, and for the most part it is, but there's one moment at the end of it that is actually pretty amazing. At the end of the DLC, you confront Dr. Ned, who's basically a guy with a machine gun. Not a super impressive final boss, but hey, every other enemy in this thing is just reused in the regular game, so reasonable. After you kill him, the credits immediately start rolling, which is kind of anticlimactic, but remember how lame the ending to Borderlands 1 was? That's not super far off. That's when the twist happens. The monstrous undead Ned literally slashes through the fourth wall and destroys the credits, and that's when the real final fight starts. <laughs> <laughs> it's not over yet. Which is significantly more elaborate and fun than the previous one. Uh, really seemed like the DLC was over at that point, but the real battle was only getting started, and it's actually kind of the best thing about it. And number eight is Time to Strut from Guardians of the Galaxy. By the time the credits roll in Square Enix's Guardians of the Galaxy game, it seems like everything's pretty much wrapped up. The grand unifier is dead. Uh, you rescued Adam Warlock and stopped Magus. Pretty dramatic final boss fight with melodrama and revelations and turnabouts. Game's gotta be done, right? Little disappointing uh, that the final boss just a rematch with the Grand Unifier, but yeah, all in all, satisfactory ending by most video game standards. You know just as much as me that that particular bar is pretty low. So you strut back to the ship, big victory music plays, credits roll. Unlike some games that pull the think you one trick, the credits go on for quite a while too. There's even one mostly inconsequential mid credit scene before the big one where it's revealed Adam Warlock had been possessed by Magus and now it's time for the real final battle. Don't worry about little old me. 
I feel simply... Fabulous. Come on! Most of the time, these kinds of twists take up a few seconds at most, but this one goes on for a while. Ready, Joe? Shoot it! Long enough that it really tricks you into thinking that's the end. And number seven is the neutral ending from Undertale. Most of the time, video games with true or golden endings make it explicitly clear that you're missing out when you don't see them. You know how it goes. You get a bad ending, and then the game all but tells you to try again. And yeah, Undertale does do that, sort of. It does it much subtler. More subtle? Not sure. It's one of the two. The standard neutral ending is the one most people who play Undertale are ever going to see. If you play the entire game without killing anyone or anything, you're still getting the neutral ending the first time through and a lot of people assume that's really all it is other than the impressively bizarre final boss fight the actual ending is extremely underwhelming it's just a hard cut to undertale after exiting the underground and then a short credits roll it seems like that was it and i guess it's just one of those games where it happens to be intentionally ambiguous you do get a few text boxes explaining what happened after you leave, but it's pretty basic. Of course, we know now that's not the ending, because after the credits, you do get a clue about what you're supposed to do to get the best ending. Depending on how you've played the game, the clue can be pretty obscure, but you get something at least. And if you restart the game, it becomes possible to get the true pacifist ending, which is generally considered to be the best ending by the community. You might not call this one a trick, it's more like the true ending is just especially secret, but at least for a little while, the game does make it seem like there's nothing else to it. And number six is the Moonshine Mobs Knockout Fake Out from Cuphead, the DLC specifically. All the new bosses introduced in the delicious last course are tough, but for some reason I had a really big problem with Moonshine Mob. The boss is just total chaos. <laughs> There's so much going on at any given time that it's hard to pay attention to any one thing, and it is absolutely relentless. And that's just getting to the fake out. It seems like the ant eater is the final form, but when you take it out, you hear the satisfying knockout from the announcer, but the actual knockout message hits wrong. It's on flypaper. Ooh, ooh, you know what that means. I mean, if you don't play Cuphead, you don't know what that means, but it's basically a false knockout message. Maybe you could infer that on your own. I don't know. Anyway, when it leaves the screen, the boss immediately starts fighting again, indicating that it was not, in fact, a knockout. The last stage is short and really not that difficult, but it does easily catch you off guard if you're not paying attention. I certainly was caught off guard. The little snail starts doing his thing, and you may be sitting still and literally looking at the anteater animation that looks done. The knockout message is obviously obviously just a trick here. They gave you one that doesn't look like the real one, so maybe you should have known. Maybe I should have known, but it worked on me. There are a few fights in Cuphead that keep going even after it seems like they should be dead, but this is the only one that tries to pull a fast one. It's short and it's obvious, but you only need to let your guard down for a second and that's when this game gets you. At number five is It's Over. Just kidding, by the DLC from Asura's Wrath. Obviously not the official name, and it, it basically any other game, this would be a sequel hook, but in this game, it's kind of an ending fake out for a few reasons. The final chapter definitely feels like an ending. The entire thing is appropriately over the top and bizarre. Uh, if you know anything about this game, if it was anything but, that would be very strange. Uh, Asura literally beats up the planet Earth. <laughs> It's ridiculous, but it, it looks like an ending. It all seems wrapped up, but if you manage to get the S rank on five episodes or complete 50 episodes total, which is more than double what's actually in the game, you get the true ending, which reveals that the golden spider that's been helping Asura is actually the bad guy. I know, who would have guessed? The game ends there, which seems like your standard sequel hook, at least until the DLC came out a while later and revealed that no, you actually just need to pay to see the rest of the game. I'm sorry, I thought it was done. I guess beating up a continent-sized monster wasn't enough. Uh, had to get more absurd, obviously. It's a sewer's rat.
In the game's defense, the DLC ending is actually pretty amazing, but still, it's an ending you have to pay for, and it's not like it came out a year later or something, it came out a month later, which means they probably could have included it in the game, but chose not to. The game doesn't just try to trick you into thinking you won, it tries to pull the rug out from under you and dangle the actual conclusion as paid DLC. Everyone makes fun of Gollum's ridiculous emotes pack, but at least that was pointless and kind of easy to make a decision about if you're going to purchase. This is the ending of the game. It is essential. Terrible idea. Or maybe great idea. I don't know how much money they made off of it. Terrible from a consumer standpoint, though. And number four, the Soul Master comes back for revenge from Hollow Knight, a good old-fashioned fake-out. Encountered in the City of Tears, the Soul Master is a pretty intimidating enemy when you're first starting out in Hollow Knight. Uh, this guy loves to teleport around. He sends homing projectiles at you, surrounds himself with damaging orbs. He's tricky to avoid. <laughs> That's all to say, this guy will give you some problems, so it can take a few times to finally take him out. And when you do, <laughs> what is this list about? He falls down, he's seemingly dead, and then he drops his desolate dive spell. But when you try to absorb it, he springs back to life, crashes through the glass ceiling, the surface you have been fighting on the whole time, and then really starts to just totally flip out. It's one of those final desperation attack moments where the boss throws everything it has at you, but it only takes a few hits to finish him off. Still, if you don't know it's coming, you're probably not going to heal before trying to get the spell, and then you just get immediately overwhelmed. It's a tough boss already, but the victory fake out really makes it a pain. And number three is the Great Frida fake out from Dark Souls 3's DLC. The boss fight, probably most infamous from the game for multiple reasons. For one, very tough. Second, it's long. It's got three total phases that you have to beat in one go. And most importantly for this list, they try to fake you out after the second one. The first fight against Sister Frida is what you'd expect. It's not super special. Phase two is when things get serious and she's joined by Father Arendelle making it a two on one fight. Beating that phase is tough, and when you do, the game wants you to think that it is over. The music stops, you get a Titanite slab, and nothing seems like it's gonna happen. It does though, out of nowhere, the music starts going crazy again, and Frida gets up, takes on her final form as Black Flame Frida. If this was just a two-stage fight, it wouldn't really be infamous, but having three stages in a row like this is just cruel. The devs really wanted to rub some salt in your wounds. There's no other explanation for why they throw such a ridiculously hard and long boss at you like this. And number two is the Guardian Ape, uh, which keeps his head in the game. From Sekiro, Shadows Died Twice. Sure, the previous entry was bad, but this one goes all the way into making you think that this boss is absolutely 100% totally dead. The Guardian Ape is a challenging encounter with a lot of tricks up its sleeve, but it saves its best one for last. Uh, when you beat a boss in Sekiro, you have to perform a death blow, which in this case involves literally cutting off the monkey's head. In some other world, I think you'd be able to safely say it was dead. And the game even tries to make you think it's all over by displaying the text that always appears when you finish off a boss, Shinobi Execution. It lays there dead for a little while, but the fight is not over yet. The ape gets up, enters phase two without a head. Uh, I mean, not entirely without a head. He's carrying it around, so I guess he still has it. And the second stage just as tough as the first, only now you have to worry about taking instant terror damage from the screaming monkey head, all while avoiding this thing's even more unpredictable attacks. This boss is just about the perfect enemy for a game tricking you into thinking you won. They pulled out all of the stops to make it look like this fight was over. Uh, he doesn't have his head attached at the neck. At this point, I thought I'd figure out all of From's tricks, but uh, I don't think that it's a disgrace to admit that they, they got me on this.
And finally, at number one, Dagon Gera defeated from Star Wars Jedi Survivor. It seems like your main enemy in the newest entry of Star Wars Jedi series is uh, Dagon Gera, himself a survivor of sorts from the High Republic era. Most of your time the game is spent in a race with him and his cronies, and when you finally confront him on top of the floating observatory, it really does seem like the final battle or really near the final battle. <laughs> I assumed there would be at least one more fight with this guy to cap things off, but no, you don't just beat him here. He is definitely killed at this moment. And now all that's left to do is return to the hidden path base and wrap things up. This part goes on for a while, and in any other game, it would be the end. But of course it is not. You have a campfire chat with all your buddies, and you go off to bed, and that's when the big twist happens. Your buddy, the one that everyone assumed would die at the start of the game, Cade, betrays you to the Empire and escapes. I was really starting to think that was it, and I won, and then the game totally swerved me. I mean, I guess I should have known. Darth Vader had to show up somewhere, right? And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.